Hello everyone, welcome to part two of my first impressions for The Fall of Max Payne. Let's get into it. At the end of part one, Payne is caught with a wanted fugitive. After returning to the precinct, he is reprimanded and placed on desk duty. Max questioned whether or not putting his neck on the line for her was worth it, but like all things that tempt us, our rational minds tend to go into hibernation. Ignoring the danger, he begins to work on his report when the phone rings. The caller on Winterson's phone hangs up immediately upon hearing his voice. I can only assume that whoever is calling does not want to speak to Payne, or have his identity known. Multiple things throughout the first part of the prologue leads me to believe she is not the shining example of morality Bravura believes her to be. For one, a man informs him that she is twitchy about her phone calls. We see at the beginning of the game she got one from her new boyfriend. When entering interrogation, the witness claims to have information regarding the cleaners, but Winterson has zero interest in them, only wanting to identify Mona. Payne later catches her on the phone leaking information to an unknown source, likely the mystery boyfriend. Immediately, she deflects, threatens him, and leaves. It is obvious she is covering for the cleaners and keeping mention of them off the official reports. Whoever sent them likely wants Mona out of the picture, so she is playing cleanup herself to do just that. This concerns me considering I am getting the impression that she may be involved with Vladimir, Payne's former ally. On a voicemail, he was speaking to a woman he was involved with saying that she knew Payne. The two choices here are Winterson and Mona, but I don't have any indication that Sax has any romantic ties at this time. If Winterson is with Vladimir, is he pulling her strings? If so, to what end? Before, I looked at Payne's journey as one of temptation to cross the line, but now it appears this is true for both him and Winterson. In literature, the hero is sometimes paired against a character who goes on a similar journey, but takes the wrong path. A mere reflection of what could happen to them. In this case, my impression is that they walk similar roads but Winterson will be consumed by it. Heading down to the holding cells, Max speaks with Mona, who claims that her life is in danger and to contact Woden for assistance. As soon as Max leaves a voicemail for him, a bomb goes off. The cleaners break into the lockup and begin searching for the assassin. It appears they want to silence this thorn permanently. By the time Max leaves the parking garage, Vladimir is already waiting for him. This is too much of a coincidence to ignore. I have a feeling he was responsible for the attack on the precinct. Vlad drops him off at the abandoned theme park and meets Mona at the entrance. Once inside, Payne enters the belly of madness, a set for the address unknown TV show. A scene plays that shows just how much control Mona has over him. If the cleaners had not crashed their way in, the two would have crossed a line in their relationship. As they move to retreat, the bridge gives way, causing Max to be cut off from her, forced to go his own path. The bridge collapsing is psychologically cutting him off from her, at least temporarily. There is a line stating that the funhouse is Mona's playground. With the delirium and insanity that goes along with this place, the game is telling us that she is at home in the madness. It is telling that this place with the subtitle Descent into Madness is her home. Coming back to this place was a lot of fun, especially now that we get to see behind the scenes. Hiding in the control room, we get to trigger the traps on the cleaners, some of which distract or eliminate them outright. By the end of this section, Payne dives into the back of the cleaners van and is driven right into their hideout. He admits that rather than trying to crack the enigma of Mona, he chooses to abandon that pursuit and focus on the case at hand. So far, this is the closest Payne has come to going off the deep end to a place he would never be able to come back from. Max makes his own Trojan horse by hiding in the back of the van and is taken right into the cleaner's hideout. Upon reaching the lobby, Mona announces that she has arrived on the wrong side of the building. The short exchange in the voice acting gives me the impression that she is concerned for him and possibly wishes to discuss what happened between them earlier. 
telling her he was too busy to discuss it feels like he is distancing himself. This will not be the first time there is awkwardness between the two in this chapter. As he ascends the condemned building, a huge shipment of weaponry is uncovered. These cleaners were armed and financed by someone with deep pockets. When Payne informs his partner of this, Mona comments that they do not appear to be as well armed as he thinks, but refuses to clarify when asked. Shortly after, enemies garbed in body armor show up. Acting as a new enemy type, they have a lot more health than the cleaner variant. We learn that the cleaning company was a facade for this paramilitary organization. Most likely a group of mercenaries hired by an unknown third party. The only factions we know of at this point is the Inner Circle, Gogniti, and Vladimir. Based upon the coincidences, I am leading towards Vlad, but it is still too early to say. In the upper floors, body bags fill one room. All the people that have been murdered by the cleaners are present along with the evidence. The stark contrast between Payne and Sax is on full display here when he asks her to call the NYPD. She promptly informs him that she is a fugitive and to go to hell. Despite the attraction between the two in both the physical and symbolic sense, they are clearly on different sides of the moral spectrum. Payne wishes to use the law to uncover the mystery behind these deaths, while Sax could care less as long as her personal goals are satisfied. In a psychological sense, the law is Payne's superego, Mona representing his id, with Max falling in the middle as the ego. The chapter begins with a few cleaners accidentally setting off some explosives in the room. This sets the entire building on fire. Much like the scene in the first Max Payne, where the restaurant was on fire, Max is forced to escape a burning building. The flames would burn away the evidence found there, leaving the option to conclude these matters lawfully far less likely. This time, however, there is more than fire to run from. Between explosive materials and parts of the building collapsing, there are dangers all over the place. My first several attempts involved me blowing things up in my face, or having a concrete beam randomly land on his head while I was standing there. Much like the symbolism in the last game, the fire can be interpreted a few ways. Burning the evidence will lead Payne closer to stepping over the line to resolve the case. It can symbolize a radical change in the sense of the old life being burnt away as well. The chapter ends with some scaffolding falling loose and knocking him out. I wonder where he will find himself when he awakens. Now, I'm sure I am not alone in my surprise for this chapter. Flashing back to when Max enters the building, we transition to Mona's point of view. I had not been expecting to ever take control of her as a playable character. Up until now, I had her labeled as a secondary character who embodies everything Max could be if he went off the leash. After spending some time in her head, I hope we learn more about what drives her. I noticed that the title of the chapter is a callback to the bullet that Mona took to the head in the first game. The implication is the bullet may have scarred her in ways that cannot be seen. Whether psychologically or due to brain trauma, he wonders if her cognitive ability has been impaired as a result. Being in her point of view, I will have to pay attention to her internal dialogue to determine if this is accurate. Moving from one end of the building to the other, Mona fights through the cleaners. Inside one room, a trio of cleaners mock a woman about her behavior around their boss, calling her an ice queen, but one that softens around their superior. This confirms for me that Winterson is somehow involved with them. We have known since the beginning that she was involved with a man that was intentionally kept anonymous from the player. One, she was leaking information as seen at the police station. Granted, this talk may be an exaggeration on behalf of the grunt troops. If this is accurate though, Winterson truly mirrors pain within the story. Whoever this boss is, to her, and Mona, to Max, the seduction to cross the line is present in both of their stories. While the first part of this chapter was wandering through rooms and mowing through bad guys, it truly starts after walking out onto the scaffolding. It is a small thing, but witnessing from Mona's perspective what was going on with Max was a fun change of pace. Even witnessing him go out the window, from her point of view, really brought it around full circle. His comments about throwing the rules out the window plays into the themes of the story. 
by stepping over the line, he ends up in a bad situation. This entire gameplay section was so much fun to go through, simply because we had both main characters on screen involved in combat. During my first attempt, Max ended up dying because I wasn't doing my duties properly. My second time through was successful, and we got to hear Payne's dialogue about Mona as we played her. The realization that he needed her not just for companionship, but survival was telling. She is everything Max could be if he went over the edge. Sometimes that is needed, however living permanently in that state could be dangerous. For a good portion of the game, he has been fighting alongside her, or at least with her in the background. Within the previous chapter, they were separated. By not having her there, he ended up in this bad situation. This entire gameplay segment involves being the guardian angel for pain, clearing his path to safety. This state of vulnerability made him confront his own mortality, and realize he did not wish to die. Up until now, the alcohol and personal neglect spoke to the contrary. I feel this acts as a big transition for him, realizing he still has things to live for. The final chapter of part 2 is focused entirely on the title, A Binary Choice. The gameplay in this section is a repeat of the previous chapter. Mona overlooks the complex and clears the path. However, the meat of it occurs in the final scene. Max's two worlds come to a head when Winterson arrives, holding Mona at gunpoint. This literally is the choice that reveals which way he goes. The binary choice segment feels to entirely revolve around this question. Will his ego choose to side with the superego, or with his id? Will he side with his passions, or with the law? In this final scene, Max must choose to allow Winterson to take Mona, knowing full well it may lead to her death, or defend her. On one hand, he preserves his position in his new life. On the other, he falls completely into the pit of his old life. Without even thinking, the moment Winterson moves to fire upon Mona, he fires first. Finally, the story comes full circle, and we see what led to Winterson's death. The story of Max Payne has involved several symbolic comparisons to Ragnarok. This is no different. The death of Winterson can be argued to parallel the death of Baldur in the first game. By killing her, the true trials leading to another psychological apocalypse begins. With backup arriving, there are witnesses to the deed. Winterson manages to get off a couple shots at Max before dying. Wounded, Payne literally and figuratively falls off the edge. This scene is what concludes part two. The fallout of this event, I presume, will be the focus of the final section of the fall of Max Payne. <laughs>